Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TF1 show. Now, I'm extremely excited today to welcome um, Josh Rivel. Rival, how, how do we pronounce your surname, actually, from a New Zealander's uh, perspective? <laughs> Rivel. Rivel. That, Rivel. That's, uh, that's the way it is, yeah. <laughs> Josh Rivel. From all the way from New Zealand, you can see he sacrificed his much needed sleep to join us today on the podcast. I'm extremely grateful for, for him taking oh, the time. Woe is me. Woe is me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Josh, for joining. Really, I really appreciate it. Hmm. No, it's all good. Thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me on. Yeah. So let's talk about obviously the Eiffel. It's the Eiffel Grand Prix. Um, mm. That's in essence, what today's episode is about. We're going to recap the Eiffel Grand Prix. Now, Josh, it was a bit of a weird one where, firstly, as per usual, rain was expected throughout the weekend and we lost Friday, no no practices, and then it was bone dry Saturday and Sunday, as per usual. Mm. Yeah, that was a slightly weird one, you know, but I think it does advocate more for uh, two uh, two-day weekends, doesn't it? Like... I mean, yeah, it throws in a bit of the unexpected, I suppose. Uh, for the Grand Prix, and it kind of brings out the skill in a lot of these drivers. Plus, we have a lot of these times where the first two practice sessions, you got to wonder whether or not they're warranted, they're needed. And this weekend, I think more leans in the direction of well, maybe a two race weekend to. Two day weekend could be the way forward, but you know, like we're, we're going to have another one at San Marino, no, not San Marino, Imola, and uh, <laughs> that will that will um, definitely, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically, it'll be interesting to see what that uh, conjures up. You know, again, new circuit, two race weekend, it's just two two day weekend. You know, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But for this one, it certainly made things a bit more interesting. Yeah, I agree. I think this, that and the cold weather threw up a couple of, of variables for the teams to deal with. I, it sounds mm-hmm. like nobody really knew before the race started what it was going to look like, what's going to happen, what the tires are going to do. They were more going to play it by yeah, which which always, I think, makes it makes it quite interesting. And I think on balance today was quite an interesting race, I have to say. Like, I think... Maybe not very dramatic, but a lot of a lot of intrigue. I thought. Mm. I mean, I think it was just again like. I mean, there's not a heck of a lot that you could do when you have Hamilton in, in the car that he has. I mean, um, I mean, sure, he has the best car on the grid, but I mean, he's one of the best drivers, not just of uh, of this generation, but of all time. You know, like. Success follows him everywhere he goes, and there's a reason for it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a lethal combination, and unfortunately gets to the stage where, you know, pretty much if you're not in, if you're not in Max's Red Bull or in Volta's car, um, you're likely to get lapped in the race, you know, which is just crazy if it wasn't for that safety car you know like we could have had a situation where third place in that race could have been lapped and yeah i mean it it, it is it is crazy a bit because you know it was you know we got to um we got to a stage in that race where i was just thinking about the battle for the lead i was just like ah crap this isn't good <laughs> Because yeah, ideally, I, ideally, you want a battle for the lead rather than seeing who's going to get six, the seventh, podium. eighth, mm. or whatever. But yeah, yeah. So let's let's maybe talk about Mercedes. Let's start with them, since you've sort of alluded to Hamilton and the way that he's been driving. Mm. I, I thought there was a, a glimmer of hope. I thought there was like a little a little pinprick of hope when Bottas out qualified Hamilton. I thought he was looking quite decent on the Saturday. And then it just fell apart during the race. Again, actually thinking about it, obviously he didn't have the best of starts, but he got back, he got one up over Hamilton uh, through turn one, two, three. And you thought, okay, well, at least, you know, Bottas is, is trying. 
he's, he's making an attempt. And then obviously, you know, with the big lockup that he had later, that cooked his goose because then he lost the position and he had to put compromise strategy. And it's just been one of, again, one of those races for Valtteri where when the tips are down and when Hamilton's chasing him down, more often than not, he fumbles it in some way. I think it's more just, you know, uh, putting this in very layman's terms, it's about whether or not Valtteri has the mongrel in him to be able to take the fight to Lewis. And there have been times this year where it doesn't look like he, didn't look like he had that. I don't think there's anything wrong with him in the pace front, at least in qualifying uh, trim. I don't, think he's ever been, I don't think there's ever been a problem with him uh, with his pure raw pace. It was just that he struggled to convert it to uh, to race wins or to battle um, Lewis. And, you know, honestly, it, it, there's a bit more to it than just simply being fast. You know, it's just, uh, again, it's just being willing to make certain moves and, uh, you know, basically escorting a driver wide, which we saw at turn one, actually, when Lewis was escorting Volteri off into, well, basically, you know, a, a whole different section of track. Yeah. You know, it's the willingness to do that kind of stuff, which Volteri, I'm not sure he would be willing to do that. Um, You know, uh, making mistakes. But, of course, to be honest, to be fair to Volteri, he didn't have a chance uh, after his... Uh, power unit failure, but I mean, still, yeah. uh, it's been a prevalent issue for the whole time, but I mean, like, you could put in George Russell if you want, but the concern I have about George Russell is that his qualifying is very, very good, but his race pace is a bit concerning, especially when you look yeah. at it side by side with Nicholas Satifi, who's... Latifi couldn't qualify to save his life, but his race performance is pretty, pretty good. He's, you know, honestly, yeah. really impressed me this year. And if he is sort of at level pegging of Russell, you know, that's that kind of worries me a little bit. No, I agree. I think, um, just quickly on on Russell, he had obviously qualifying. is we know we know how good he is, but in the races, he, he does seem to have quite a lot of incidents. Strangely, like a race pace aside, like you're, he's always in the thick of things. And if there's some Williams having trouble, more often than not, it seems to be George Russell for some reason. I have to say well, today, to be, though, to be fair, he is he is messing about with the Grosjeans and the Magnussons. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, that's he is a in dangerous, in dangerous tra- territory. Absolutely. Um, but no, I, I think I think I agree with you to a large extent. I think Vartas maybe for this year is still the best that Mercedes has. I just think that on race day with all the many variables that he has to deal with Hamilton just seems to have some I guess natural instinct to just always stringing these race days together like and a lot of people think that no but he gets lucky or no but he doesn't make mistakes but he's always putting himself in a position to enable that I feel I think in the way that he goes about his racing he tries to cover as many bases as possible. He always seems like he has Bottas and Max covered, where I think it was the, if it was the other way around, Hamilton always seems to be parked on their gearbox for lap after lap after lap. So I agree with you. I think, in a sense, this has been a more encouraging weekend for me, for Bottas. One of his better weekends, in a way, before the engine failure and the lockup, until, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's just my really- sense. What we need is something that he was doing um, in Australia 2000, last year, basically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, just that strong start to the year. The problem with Hamilton is he's a driver that you really need to... Uh, you need to get the jump on him early. You know, that's that's what Nico did. And But the thing yeah. with Nico is that... Um, one thing I do not understand for the life of me is that people envision him as, you know, this average driver this overrated world champion i'm just like what planet are you on what championship were you watching you know i think the one thing that this is doing right now vaulted his performances is proving just how good rosberg was i mean 
Ah, oh, definitely. The one thing I hate from hearing from people is this thing about overrated world champion. There's no such thing. Yeah. Um, Agreed. So, you know, like, but the one thing that Nico did, and he, he messed up a few times for sure, but he always took the fight to, to Lewis. He always made the, uh, the pertinent decisions at those times. He did not care about the consequences of his image or what forth. He knew what he was trying to accomplish. And in the end, he did that. Uh, the, the only thing is, I don't reckon that either Volteri is willing to do that or he can do that. Either way, it's, it's not working. It's no good doing it for one or two raises at the start of the year, which is what he yeah. did last year. You need to carry that on for the whole year, and he just hasn't been able to do that. So, you know, it just sucks at the end of the day. Yeah, and the thing is, but just keep saying that you won't resort to the dark arts. You won't try and get some sort of psychological You're gonna advantage. Need to. You're going to need to. Yeah, at the end of the day, what is it, it is, well, it's now what, his fourth year driving Easter Hamilton? It is evident that he is yeah. not as fast. Like, it is now, I think, a fact that he's going to have to accept that Hamilton is I probably... Think I think it's just more... I don't know if it's about... Not, 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 not raw faster. speed. When I say raw I speed, I... I think when I say I fast, I mean just overall. When it comes to obviously qualifying is really, really close, but tire management, race management, those areas are things that he's trying to improve, and he is. I think he is improving, or he, he says he's improving. But the problem is, you can only give a driver so so long. Yeah, you know, and this is why, yeah. you know, this is why I was critiquing, for example, Lance Stroll at sort of at the start of this year. It's like. You know, you give a driver one or two years, cool, that's fine. You give them a third year, you're kind of pushing it. And if by the end of the third year, they haven't shown much, which in Lance's case, for example, I was thinking, yeah, some good performances, but on the main, you know, you've got this horrific qualifying record. You're being outraced more often than not. This isn't good. After three years, you should show something. But with Volteri, you know, four years now, like that's inexcusable. I mean, we're branding, you know, Albon for half a year, you know? Yeah. We're, we're in, a, in a Red Bull environment, which may or may not be totally, you know, fair. Um, and, you know, we, we're brandishing him uh, after this one, but... Volt again, Volty after four years now, and nothing coming to show for it. You know that's very, very concerning. I think is a diplomatic way to put it. <laughs> no, absolutely, and I think that Merck is keeping him around. Firstly, because I think if if this was, and I actually raised this point last year already, because when we were sort of in the thick of things with Ferrari and Red Bull, sort of being there or thereabouts when it came to Mercedes pace. If you think about like the second half of the season last year, I was thinking to myself, if that level of performance between the three teams continued into this year, Mercedes would be in big trouble. Like I was legitimately worried that Mercedes was going to be in trouble with Bottas as their other driver. Because if you had Vettel and Leclerc on the pace and Max obviously in the Red Bull didn't know what's going to happen with Albon, but then I don't know if Bottas in equal machinery would have been able to do the job that he has to do for Mercedes against those teams. And I think he sort of got away with it this year because Mercedes basically built the most ridiculous car that we've ever seen. And Red Bull dropped the ball at the beginning of the year and Ferrari had a, an, a, an engine problem. Oh, sorry. Lost you there. You're back. Um, but, I'm back. Yeah. Um, so you know, like trying to pick up on a question where I missed half of it. Uh, um, so, so basically, I just said I mean, if if we were in the second half of 2019, basically same level of performance. Do you think Bottas would have been able to do the job that he was supposed to do for Mercedes if we had the, all the talent that that Ferrari and Red Bull have in their cars? It depends upon it depends upon your perspective, you know, of that. Because a real cynic will say, "Well, their performance will never be because you know their Ferrari power unit was illegal." Mm -hmm. 
but let's theorize here for a moment that it was all totally legal. Uh, that another cynic would say, well, Seb would spin every two races and he doesn't fight the stereotype with that. Um, you know, like, I think the issue hasn't ever really been about Bottas being able to score points or anything like that. It's just been about, it's just been able to about, uh, bleh, sorry, it's just been about whether he can challenge um, Hamilton. But in the main, I think, you know, Bottas can be a bit of a sort of points machine. He's always there to finish second or third. I'd love to see his trophy cabinet. Um, you know, uh, so no, I don't necessarily think that he that it would have been detrimental toward Mercedes in the overall standings, because while Bottas isn't quite on Hamilton's level at least at the moment, I think you know Red Bull and Ferrari they've got their own problems really. Uh, even if their performance was up to the level of which it was last year. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Let's maybe before we move on to to the other teams, let's just take two seconds to think about or reflect on the fact that Hamilton and I are finally equal Schumacher's record of 91 wins in, in Grand Prix mm-hmm. history. Now, obviously, there are very much two sides to the coin here where a lot of people applaud him for an incredible effort where people thought for, you know, people thought Schumacher's records weren't going to be break broken for decades. And here we are, what, 15 years later, and it's it's been broken. And, you know, Hamilton has obviously had the support of an incredible team. And you need the car to be able to break records like this. But where, where do you stand on it? Where do you rate or rank Hamilton's achievements? I mean, people, of course, are going to point toward the car. My response is, if it's not him, it's someone else, you know? And he's got a teammate, too. And, I mean, it takes two to tango, basically. You know, you've got to have a good, you've got to have a good driver with good input, with all that jazz at the head of that car, guiding the team all the way. You put a nobody in that team, it's not going to really go too far, you know? I guess what I'm trying to say here is that, I mean, we can talk about the car all we want. At the end of the day, you know, Senna had the MP44, Schumacher had the, well, basically the Ferraris of the early 2000s. Uh, You know, Clark had the 49, you know, Fangio had basically whatever was the best car at the time, whether it was the 250 F or whatever. Every great driver had a great car to go with it, but it wasn't without reason. So, you know, Hamilton fits the same mold. But, you know, irrespective, you could just tell apart the great drivers, the good ones from the great ones. And he's someone where, you know... There's, there are some times where you just look at some of his laps and you're just like, how are you doing that? And in the races, he's almost faultless a lot of the time. Granted, there is the occasional blunder, and then in every race, there's, he, there's the, basically the the uh, Hamilton Radio bingo of Bono, my tyres are dead, and the safety car needs to hurry up. But, mm-hmm. I mean, apart from that, you know, like, in my books, the best driver of this generation and one of the greatest drivers of all time. It's tricky. Put- yeah. It's tricky putting him on that totem pole directly of like, whether he's you know first, second or third, but he is one of the best of all time and you don't have to like him, but you do have to respect his talent. And I think that's what a lot more people have to start doing, you know, rather than um, debating upon whether or not he pays tax or anything like that, you know, like, I, mean, I don't care about his tax evasion stuff. If he wants to do that, that's fine. Let him live in Switzerland or Monaco or wherever he lives and dodges his taxes. Um, and what kind of lifestyle do you mean? Like, who cares? We want doesn't we, take we away from the uh, performances. Exactly. You know, we we just care about how he is as a driver, and how he is as a driver is of a legend. Question yeah. is, where is he going to end now? Like a hundred or something? Like it'll be interesting. Possibly. No, 100% agree. Toto Wolf actually put it quite nicely. Um, 
he basically just said, you know, Toto Wolf just said, the, the, there's a reason that he's in the car. The best drivers get the best cars. And it's not like he was a nobody before he got into the Mercedes. He won 21 races with McLaren, where that car was, I would arguably say, before he went to Mercedes, the McLaren was the best car for one season out of the five. Yeah, I mean, I think then was a time where, yeah, you could talk about how X was a better car than Y. But the gap wasn't big, unlike yeah. it was today. I think yeah. in 07 and 08, you know, the Ferrari and McLaren were was arguably, very close. you know, very close. 07, he was unlucky to lose a championship in the way he did. Although, if I mean, like, I mean, he went off in China and then he had the gearbox issue in, in, in Entre Lagos. So that was unlucky for him. Imagine winning the championship in your first year. Oh, yeah, it would have been... been- ridiculous mm. but i mean like yeah then in 09 uh car wasn't brilliant really 2010 it, i mean 2011 it, it was quite close between the, the mclaren was i think the second best car probably on balance like if it took took the average across the season i think they were just behind the red bull problem was around that time that was when sort of hamilton was something was going on with him like he it, it definitely wasn't and the right mindset, at least for what a Formula One driver should be. And there's been a huge change, uh, change around, uh, since that time. But you know, like 2011 was awful. And that's something that I point that to. That was toward. his worst year by far. <sighs> yeah. And that's something I sort of point toward with, uh, likes of Seb, for example. It's like, uh, me personally, I've had doubts about Seb for the past, not just. Ooh, we lost Josh. Why oh, I, I can't hear Josh anymore. Let's give him a sec. Can you hear me? Yeah, back. Body mic fell out. But yeah, I've had <laughs> um, Seb for the like, last two or three seasons based on uh, just the amount of mistakes, you know? And it's similar to Hamilton back then. It's just like mistake after mistake after mistake. Like, this is not on. Um, but, you know, he eventually cleared that up. Um, so, you know, there are dark times in a, in a racing driver's career, and that was that was one of them. But he still, in those times, managed to win races. Um, with, uh, with that one season, uh, 2011 was the only one where uh, Boston beat him. But, yeah, it was... Well, and Rosberg, obviously, 2016. But apart from that, he's um, triumphed against all his teammates. So, you know, that's got to account for some. No, fully, fully, fully agree. I think the thing is, there's always going to be caveats to anyone, to any driver's performance at the end of the day. Um, But if you look at the numbers, if you look at his portfolio of work that he's put together over how long has his career now been, this is his 14th year, like undisputably one of, the great careers in Formula One. Like there's there's no way to argue against that in my mind. Mm. Alrighty, Josh, let's talk about our favorite blue team, Red Bull. Now Max had a he had a good weekend, a strong weekend, similar like, like to what we now I guess expect from Max. Qualified really well. Maybe for a moment we thought he might outqualify the Mercedes, but at the end of the day, maybe just missed that last two, three tenths. And in the race did everything right. Didn't do didn't really put a foot wrong, I'd say. Like, did everything he could. Yeah, I mean, he's... Uh, I got my thoughts on him with regards to how uh, I think of him. You know, he's something special. But I do wonder. It, it doesn't make any sense to me because I've was. i been researching for um, an upcoming video on Albon. Because... Mm-hmm. It seems just more apparent. Albon, uh, Albon's miss, uh, underperformance rather, uh, compared to what Gasly's was. Uh, and I, and I look back and apparently, on average, like Albon has been closer to Max than what, uh, Pierre was last year, which doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, because for some reason we're finding this to be a bit more of a prevalent issue with Albon. For whatever reason, but 
something's clearly amiss because going into this, neither Pierre nor Ga- uh, neither Pierre nor uh, Albon were bad drivers. Mm-hmm. For God's sake, Albon's a world karting champion. He's beaten all his teammates in in junior formula. He was at level pegging with Daniel Kvyat, you know, before he was put into Red Bull. And now all of a sudden he's like four, five, six tenths, same as Pierre, off the pace. I just don't, I just don't know. Like it, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't really make a lot of sense here, you know? Like yeah. For that amount of disparity in pace. I have, I have a couple of theories. The first one being that, and I think at least in my mind, my weird and wonderful mind explains to me why Red Bull is very much more patient with Albon compared to how they were with Pierre, or at least that's the impression that I'm getting. And I think when Albon struggled as well, they realized, ooh, it might actually be a car issue to an extent where Max has a very specific preference as to how this car is supposed to operate. And I guess what the optimum setup for this car needs to be. And it is turned out to be a bit of a struggle for other drivers to deal with it. Like Alex even admitted, he said, Max, the amount of stability, instability that Max is able to handle is way more than any of his other teammates that he's ever had. And he said, like, Char- he, he, he drove against Charles, he drove against George, and he was teammates with Charles in, in, in GP3. And he said that, I mean, Alex was able to deal more with deal with more real, real instability than what Charles was able to deal with. And, I mean, Mac, he basically just said Max is at a different level in terms of his ability to drive around car problems or unstable inst- inst- rears, which obviously from a driver's perspective is a really good thing because we can see the performances is dragging out of the Red Bull. But from a car setup, car development perspective, is that necessarily such a good thing? Because does Max maybe not identify fundamental problems with the car that is now catching out, well, first caught out Pierre and now is catching out Alex? I mean... Different driving styles uh, throughout the grid, you know. I mean, Seb is super reliant on a stable rear end. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, I mean, Max definitely is a driver that would like something that sort of was a bit more pointy, a bit more edgy, you know. Mm-hmm. It depends upon what you're looking for from a car, you know, um, and everything like that. But no two, I mean, well, not necessarily no two drivers, but if you've got two drivers in a team with polar opposite sort of driving styles, that does present problems. I think we um, see that with Ferrari at the moment. I think Ferrari is having that trouble where Leclerc and Vettel seem to like um, different things. I personally think that Charles, Charles Leclerc can sort of drive around anything. I, I see him as being one of those talents. Mm-hmm. And I don't really agree that... Ferrari is stifling Vettel because what is the point of that? Literally, what that actually, should be what themselves actually in the is the point. Um, I, I'm not saying that where Vettel is is totally Vettel's fault. You know what I am saying is that we can't look at the four or five tenth pace deficit and say it's totally down to Ferrari because it's not. And every one-off thing, it's just a constant sort of thing that's going on. And that's, yeah, that's because Charles Leclerc can drive around problems a little bit better, but, you know, it is a bit concerning that this is happening against a four-time world champion. But again, that goes back to the different driving style thing, where, um, you know, like... Well, I think we lost Josh there again. I love New Zealand internet. Don't worry, uh, South African internet is magnificent as well. Oh, really? I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was New Zealand internet. We haven't coped since we drew against the Wallabies. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I understand. I understand. Mm. Um. Anyways, um, what I wanted to ask you, Josh, given that we're talking about uh, about Albon now, today's race, obviously, people thought that his race performance today wasn't great. Saw a lot of thing, a lot of comments from people saying that he, this is a really bad race for him. I will fully admit that his top 
of Kvyat and chopping off Kvyat's front wing was a blunder. Like that was just one of those young person errors. Like I feel that's just a bit of a rookie error. One of those things that you mistakes you make once and then you never make again. I think that was one of those. But and then obviously the lockups that he had compromised his strategy to an extent. But and I, you know, after you said that Albon is performing better relative to Max compared to Gasly. I, I find mean, that that's looking at his uh, that's looking at his times and uh, such true qualifying, but also why well, I think during the race there have been times where Albon's been ballsy. Like he, that's he's what I made those that's moves. what I'm getting at. And actually, lit, like and so many people were slate before this, but after making that first pit stop and putting on the mediums, mm. he was literally running faster than the three front runners like mm. you would like it's obviously i was following the live timing during that period of the race looking at his lap times where, where he had to catch up and overtake you know the williams and the hasses and all of those he was running at a serious pace and that's where mm. at least for me i feel that red where red bull sees something in him still because i think mm. they can see that it is there it's now just they need to access it more frequently and get him in a position that it is, yeah, I guess just more easily accessible because compare, comparing again him against Pierre at Red Bull, Pierre was just stuck. Like he didn't make overtakes. He got stuck behind a McLaren and a Renault and a, and a, and a Ferrari and he'd just be there for the rest of time. And he'd literally, if he didn't move forwards, he moved backwards. So... Mm. I, that to me was, I guess, still the fundamental difference. But again, it's really, really tough for Albon at the moment with all of the the noise around him. I'd say there are two examples I want to bring up: Sergio Perez at McLaren in 2013, and something else which my mind is escaping me right now. It's I only got two hours sleep. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> what was the other example? Oh my goodness gracious me! Um, but. Uh, let's go with the 2013. Let's go with Perez. Yeah, Perez there for a second. Uh, oh, yeah. The other one I see actually was Max himself. But, um, yeah, so 2013 so Jeff Perez and Max Verstappen in Red Bull sort of about 2017-ish, you know, that kind of time. Both of those drivers at this time were struggling. Like, um, unnecessary accidents. Uh, a little bit off the pace from their teammates. And there were questions being raised because, you know, it's like, what's going on here? I thought this person was the next Messiah of all time. Now here they are, and they're doing these stupid errors. What's going on here? But, of course, we don't say that now. We don't doubt them now. I think people, at the end of the day, they look at a poor run of form, and they take it as though this guy is a bad driver, that he's not worthy of being a Formula One and all this other rubbish. Uh, for God's sake, if someone's doing that for three years or whatever, yeah, definitely not. You know, that's definitely not someone who should be in Formula One. But half a year? Come on, people. Like, and- he, he, t- he took him this long to get a podium. Brazil, Austria. He should have gone to the podium then. You got to account for extenuating circumstances. I think, honestly, he's shown more promise than Pierre. Not, not to say Pierre's a bad driver at all. It's just about who's shown more promise. But, again, people aren't being very patient, which is hysterical because there are some drivers who, you know, after two or three years were somewhat average and people were saying no 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 he'll he'll be good he'll be good you give Albon half a year and it's just like nope we'll throw you to the wolves make him mind that people think about the fact that Albon this is now he's supposed to be his first year in F1 except he basically missed half a year of like it's just he's just had a really really difficult time in terms of finding his feet like so many things have been happening he was supposed to go, you know, start in Australia, and then there was a pandemic for four or five months that essentially, mm. what, broke all of his any momentum that he had to build up. And then all of a sudden, these races just kept coming thick and fast. Then it's for six weeks, six races almost, where he just has to perform day in, day out. And again, 
with everything that's been going on, I don't think that's reasonable to expect the moon and the stars from him. I think that um, we're in a proper season now. It's like it's an eighteen race season, or is it? Is it eighteen race? Seventeen or eighteen? Not sure. That's a solid season, so I would count this as just being a normal season. It's the same yeah. for everybody. So I mean, I count this as being a year and a half. But I didn't quite understand why they threw Albon into the seat so early um, last year. Personally, personally, I would have just put um, what's that log with the bad sunglasses? Caveat: put him into the uh, seat, <laughs> um, you know, because he's had the experience and see if he's got something there. Yeah, you know? let him be uh, in the Red Bull. Let Gasly and Albon duke it out for maybe you know, 2020 as well. And then whoever's the better driver out of that, then you put them up into the, um, yeah. the reboot seat. And if they underperform, Albon's been around long and uh, well, the other driver would have been around for long enough. Then you could do the bloody musical chairs stuff. But I mean, it was a very abrupt thing to throw Albon into there after half a year. I mean, he wasn't underperforming against, um, against caveat, but it was just, a little early, you know? Yeah. I think Red Bull were just like, well, we've tried Kvyat. We didn't like Kvyat. Got lost. Kvyat got lost. Now let's try whoever we haven't tried yet. And I get it from a principal perspective, but from a practical perspective, I agree with you. I think it was too early. I think they they didn't play their, their hand right there, Red Bull. Maybe out of pride, maybe out of hope. Don't know what they were doing, mm. but at the end of the day, that's where we are now. I still think people still keep saying that no, Alex is going to be out. I don't think he's going to be out. I think they're going to keep him till at least the end of the year. Yeah, and uh, something also um, during that race. I mean, yeah, he was making strides forward and, and so forth, but um, when he was chasing Gasly, I was like. Why is he not passing him? He's clearly he's clearly faster through a lot of this track. Why is he not passing him? And then I noticed, like coming out of the corners, um, through his battle with Gasly, I was like, he's gotten a freaking grunt. That thing is slow coming out of the corners. And, and I was thinking, is there something wrong with his power unit? Two laps later, he's retired. Yeah, <laughs> due to the power unit failure. So it's true. Yeah, I mean that's that's a problem. That's in the end why he had to sort of dive bomb Gasly, which I was thinking I, I winced at because it was just like yeah. God. But then you it was a bit of a hope and it was a just like, Well, he had to do it, but it was yeah. him doing that move, which was damn daring. And yeah. then he said on the radio, "They raced me so hard." I'm just like, "It's welcome to you Formula know One." What uh, sport yeah. you are in, man? <laughs> But, <laughs> it's sort of it's literally line one of the job description is race hard mm. <laughs> but anyway um cool josh let's move on to to the midfield so let's talk about reno racing point mclaren our three front runners of of the midfield at the moment now obviously daniel got his long-awaited podium mm-hmm. um i assume you were pleased i don't know how you feel how how, how are new zealand australia relations at the moment are they are there, we're all good, good except for when it comes. To, we're all good when it, except for when it comes to sports. This is like I see. I see. Uh, we're all brothers, and but uh, once it comes to us, um, you know, playing sport, it's pretty much all right. Well, every man for himself. <laughs> but um, I mean, irrespective, I think. I mean, Daniel has a mad following, not just you know in this part of the world, but just everywhere, really. I mean, he, he's a likable guy, you know? There's there's no real reason to hate him at all. Um, yeah. You know, so I think at the end of the day, how he's driving for Renault is outstanding. Um, is it the right move for him to be moving? I don't know. Because we don't know what that Alpine is going to be like next year. But, most of all, sorry. But um, McLaren seems a team that's moving in the right direction. And, you know, if it keeps on going in that direction, it'd be a hell of a move for him. But, yeah, yeah, um, mega performance today. I don't think there's anything more I can say other than that, really. It was just what you would expect from Daniel Ricciardo. 
Yeah, he's he's a driver very much in form. Um, his teammates Ocon. Now I get a lot of flack because I actually like Esteban Ocon, but mm. again, he did a decent job, basically on Ricardo's pace and during qualifying. Like I think it was less than a tenth difference between the two of them, and then in the race he was running at somewhere in the top ten, I think sixth or seventh or fifth or something, and then obviously had to retire with a hydraulics issue. So a decent performance from him. I don't really have much to say about him, even though we didn't really see him do much during the race. But I guess Ocon, at least it encourages me that he's at least sort of up. up. It seems like he's up and running to a large extent. Mm. It's a tricky one with Ocon. I mean, people are so fickle, aren't they? I remember the outcry when he was ousted from yeah. uh, Racing Point. Um uh, for Sir Lancelot, and uh, what well, saying he he needs to be in Formula One. It's a travesty that he's not in Formula One. Then yeah. he comes back in, he runs three tenths off of Ricardo. It's just like oh, he's a crap driver. It's like where? What is he doing here? Yeah. Did you get this idea from? <laughs> like, I mean, oh my god! You know, it's just it's crazy. I mean, yes. It, it, it doesn't make sense why he's this far back, but come on, people. Like, it just, yeah. It, what we'll say is that Ocon does need to get his um, his act together for next year because Nando's going to come in. And yeah. while I do not really like Al, uh, Alonso from a personal perspective, you know, his arrogance and all that stuff, he reminds me... Of me. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it, it, I don't like that too much. But from a driving perspective, you could probably count drivers on this level with, you know, just one hand. Like, you just very few drivers can match his ability. And having that type of talent in that team, in that Renault team, with the way that it's going in the moment. Uh, yikes! Could be big. Yeah. Could be big. I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, Alcon needs to be prepared for that for sure. Um, and especially as well when he's going to try. I mean, Fernando is going to try and get the team to revolve around him, as he did yeah. with say McLaren and such. It's not going to get much easier for Alcon, unfortunately. Definitely not. I think Ricardo, as teammates go, is probably one of the best ones to have in terms of politics because he doesn't really play politics. He just does the job. Where I think next year it's going to be a different kettle of fish for our boy Esteban. He's going to have to deal with the full might of the Nando mm. in, in 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 every way and form. So that's going to be that's going to be an interesting one. Now McLaren, Josh, this weekend they were slightly on the struggle bus. I don't know if you had the same. Um, the same perception. They seem to have some trouble with one of their upgrades that they're bringing. Um, and science was not having a good time. Like he was complaining about it so much about how he was struggling with the car and with the setup and with understeer and just not having a nice time. But I mean, he still came fifth in typical Carlos science fashion. He doesn't have an first lap retirement or a reliability problem. He gets the job, gets the job done, gets the points. Norris obviously had engine troubles throughout and eventually culminated in him parking up on in the gravel with a broken sounds like it was a broken um, MGUK or MGUH. Not sure. Doesn't matter. Well, it was melting his bloody car at the end of it. It was like it's, it's not the best thing to have smoke coming from your car. Yeah. Um, you know, that's often a sign of a problem. Um, but you know, like I think it's a solid combo. Yeah, no, definitely. All righty, let's talk. <laughs> We're back. We're back. Let's 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 move on to uh, racing point because I want to just park at Nico Hulkenberg. You know your favorite driver, Lance Stroll. Obviously, the 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 world literally fell out of his bottom um, this this race weekend, and luckily we had we had Nico Hulkenberg to save the day again doing things with that racing point and scoring them good points that I guess we would not have expected a couple of days ago. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, get get uh, get well soon, Lance. Uh, thankful you didn't go the full Elvis Presley with your uh, with your illness. Um, but uh, with with Hulk, I mean, that is an incredible effort. You know, I mean, yeah, people will say, "Ah, oh, well, the the other drivers only had one practice session, and that wasn't much either." So it's like, well, Nico wasn't even intending to get in the car when he woke up that morning. He was literally at 11. He said he was chilling in Cologne, like mm, thinking so. about what he's going to say on TV. Mm. But to be honest with you, I mean, he did know the car at least. So that, that was beneficial to him. So he knew the car. Um, thankfully, his opposition didn't have much in the way of practice. Uh, nevertheless, four laps before going into the event. Um, a lot of practice. I was predicting he'd get about ninth or tenth because he's he can pedal a car and the racing point is pretty decent. And I was expecting at uh, the Nurburgring a circuit like that. You know, that's some place where potentially he would, you know, benefit from some attrition, and he did. So, but to get uh, eighth overall, yeah, was that eighth? yeah, that exceeded my expectations so obviously yeah definitely a damn good job and i think just him uh you know just getting in that car in the first place and getting it to that position yeah definitely warrants uh driver of the day definitely i agree i agree 100 percent. now talking about other drivers of the day josh and these are again maybe drivers that are very much in your in your whatsapp group if we can place them there um roman grosjean and kevin magnuson in the house they, for once, or, you know, they had one of their three strong races of the season. Roman Grosjean coming home in ninth place, scoring some some handy points. So I guess we can give them props for a really, really good performance. Like, I think getting the has in the points is is nothing to sniff at, I think, if you're, if you're Roman Grosjean. Mm. The problem with both of those drivers has never been about whether or not they're good. They are. Like... I only have a problem with Roman in the sense that I don't think he's the same driver he was back in 2013 to 2015 where he was genuinely lightning. Um, it's just inconsistency, you know? And then K-Mag, I, I feel, is a person who uh, purposely seeks detention back in back in school. You know, he, he's someone who just, you know, to the, almost looks for trouble. Um, and, you know, Gunter Steiner, he's obviously, you know, he, he said before, uh, you know, we, we're looking at 10 drivers and, uh, you know, we, we've seen what, which one is better. Um, you know, it, it, the, him saying that publicly tells me that he's had enough of both of them. Yeah, um, and I understand it. Like, and I actually tweeted about it earlier. The thing is, Grosjean and Magnussen's ultimate ability was never brought into question. It is the fact that they only do this two or three races a year, and it's a 21-race season. So you can't have them dropping the ball, you know, 50% of the time or 70% of the time, and then the 30% that they actually do well, then we're like, oh, look, look how well they're doing. I still think, honestly, Grosjean, I think his goose is cooked. Like, I think he's gone. Magnussen, I'm on the fence. They might keep him just for consistency. But I, if I was Gunter Steiner, and obviously, you know, I, 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 I should be a team principal. But, you know, Gunter needs to get rid of both of them, get either Perez or Hulkenberg in for an experienced hand, if that's what he wants, and get, get a junior in there, uh, an F2 driver to build the team, or at least to build the team around. Because... If that team has long-term, I guess, ambitions, they are going to want to have drivers that grow with the team. At the end of the day, they don't want they don't want to be a one-stop shop for drivers essentially to move on into other teams. In my opinion, at least. Mm. Well, let's actually have a look at those options. Yeah, definitely either Perez or Hulk. But personally, I think Perez, on the basis that he could drag a podium out of almost any car he's in. Um, yeah, he's got he's got the funding, so it helps how Haas out financially. Um, pity for Hulk, 
No, but he, Hulk had a long it's career. Still, so. mm, it's the way it is. Hulkenberg, Hulkenberg. Uh, so let's evaluate that second seat. So you look at F two drivers, Callum Eilat. Look, I'm sorry. Why is he all of a sudden a factor? Why all of a sudden in his racing career is he being looked at for Formula One? Were we saying this before? <laughs> Am I missing I think... something? I'm I'm aware that he's having a damn good year, but it's one year. I mean, I really hate to sound like an asshole, but it's more just a case of I look at someone like Robert Schwartzman, who's done well for years. You know, won Toyota Racing Series title, Formula Three title, came in. He's inconsistent this year, yeah. But every rookie's inconsistent this year. Every single rookie has been inconsistent. The only ones that haven't is Eilat and Schumacher, who have had that one year of experience under their belt. Um, so there's that, you know. Um, but still, like, Schwartzman's got I'm going to no throw it back to you. Just mm-hmm. would Haas get Schwartzman in if they know Schwartzman is probably going to disappear in two years' time? if his career trajectory goes in the way that we think it is. It depends upon your perspective because, I mean, I don't think personally, unless something happens with Leclerc, I don't really think that Schwartzman is getting a sniff of that Ferrari Ferrari seat. seat. Well, we have Schumacher as well. Yeah, you're right. Mick just seems cut out for that Ferrari team, you know? And so that... You know, you've got to think about it at the end of the day. Signs are sweating bullets. He, he'll be thinking, well, okay, I might as well start planning where I'm going next. Yeah, he <laughs> has two years. Two years to have a nice time in Ferrari to say he has a Ferrari oh, drive. Oh, contracts in Formula then, 1, yeah. They and then mean, he's going to have to find another seat. <laughs> contracts mean dick in Formula 1. Yeah. Nice. Um, but, yeah, so there's those two F2 drivers. And then another one you've got to factor in, Nikita Mazepin. Now... Russian with money, yeah, 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 whatever. I, I don't I don't care about how much money someone has. If I did, I'd be talking about stories of how Lance uh, about how Lawrence Stroll spent sixteen million euros on Lance's junior career in two years. But you know, there's no point bringing it up. Um, all I care about at the end of the day is how they deliver on track. So how is Mazepin? And the answer is decent, pretty decent driver. What do you do when you take one? Mazepin over Eilat? No, but that's you know it, it's 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 not a case of a slam dunk. You know, yeah. Eilat's definitely better. It's a case of depending upon the day, Mazepin can, can be better than Eilat. Yeah, but it depends upon when those days are. Uh, in terms of long, uh, in terms of longevity for the team and the benefit financially, if Mazepin, um, Mazepin's father would invest uh, millions Big upon millions bucks. of rubles into that team, um, which ironically, in the past four years, would not the would not be the only Russian backed outfit for America. But you know, it gets getting beside the point here, and I've just lost quite a few. Um, Southern supporters, but you know, like, um, uh, I guess the gist of it is that if they got Mazepin to that seat, it wouldn't be a case of wow, this is an untalented guy getting in, yeah. not at all. Mazepin can definitely drive very, uh, very similar to Sergei Sorokin, where I remember there was a bit of an uproar about him getting into Williams. It's just like, why are you guys in uproar? He's a good driver. You know, and he yeah, he hasn't, and he, he has outperformed, and, you know, and he actually came in and actually outperformed Stroll in 2018 in that one Although year that, he got, that so. was like outperforming me in a Formula One car at that point, like uh, Sorotkin outperforming Stroll. <laughs> should we how, should we attach how achievement? How how dare you uh, you insult so long? Insult so long, so long. <laughs> um, oh, man. No, I think I think the Haas seat is a really really interesting one. I don't see though how Gunter has ten drivers on his his list. Um, I could think of like six when I when I when I thought about potential drivers for the seats. But I mean, 
it's going to be interesting to see. I'll be honest. I think I'll take Mazepin. The thing is, if they take Mazepin, it'll just be another Magnussen Grosjean situation in my mind. We have a driver that on his day can do serious damage, but then mm. 50% of the time he's going to have some spectacular accident fighting for 16th place with George and Russell. Mazepin does seem to be that driver as well. So, you know. <sighs> But then again, like it's not a case. It's not a case either where, you know, their current two drivers don't have that much in the way of backing. Whereas Mazepin would just bring in, yeah, just bring the dollars of money. Yeah, yeah, so it's not quite the same. But you know, having said that, Haas need results first and foremost. And I think if you're gonna have to bring in an F two driver. It'll be between Eilos and Schwartzman, but again, it would probably depend upon your perspective of whether or not Eilos' um, performance this year was more down to you and I virtuosi, or whether or not he actually is a full-time uh, campaigner potentially in Formula One, or whether Schwartzman has um, more potential. Again, it's all down to it's all down perspective. to uh, perspective. Yeah, no, I agree, hundred percent. All right, let's let's really talk about our last team, which is Alfa Romeo. Um, we've mm-hmm. discussed all of the others briefly. Now, Alfa Gio, Antonio Giovinazzi. I mean, mm. what an what a weekend for him! I thought it was quite funny actually um, that the one weekend where Eilard and, and Schumacher tested in in the teams, and I guess well, Eilard was in, supposed to be Grosjean's car, and and Schumacher was supposed to be in, in, in Giovinazzi's. That both of them scored points. You can't script it any better, but I don't know about you, but yeah, Giovinazzi had a good weekend and he's, 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 he's done well here and there, but I still think at the end of the day, ex- except if he completely lights it up for the remainder of the season, he's probably not going to have a drive next year, despite his, his decent performance today. Uh, he's not really doing anything wrong. Yeah. You know? He's, he's honestly, you can't look at his performances and say, you know, he's crap or anything like that. He's not crap. He's just in a really bad spot where, you know, you got all these Ferrari driver Genius. academies and juniors. It's like, what can you do? Like, <laughs> you genuinely can't do anything, you know? Um, and unfortunately, Raikkonen had some damn good results, you know, in the past few, few races. Um, it's a very hard thing, really, for for Geo because again, yeah. Do I think do I think he's F one worthy? Definitely. Do I think that he's doing enough right now to stay in Formula One? Yeah. Will he stay in Formula One? I think it's a hard no. <laughs> like you just, I mean, he's definitely he's definitely out of a seat, which is unfortunate. But again, it's just more down to so whether, whether or not he's. Well, I suppose the best way to look at it is this. Is he better than Mick Schumacher? And Ooh, having compared, I Actually. mean, like, uh, I always thought Mick was good. It was just like I didn't understand why he took a year and a half to sort of all of a sudden get his motor running. But you know, again, I oh dear, yeah, <laughs> it's somewhere. not going well somewhere. <laughs> But yeah, again, just watching him in F2 this year, just he's got all the ingredients. Mick does. Got all the ingredients for future success. And I don't know if I could say the same, sing the same praises for Geo. And if that's the answer to the question, you know, well, I think I've pretty much answered whether or not it's got to be Mick or it's got to be Geo for the seat next year. Oh well, I'm back. You're back again. Hopefully, uh, hopefully those cops. Yeah, hopefully those cops are sorting out the internet, and that's what it was all about. <laughs> yeah, they they probably it wasn't actually cops. It was the alarm bells for Giovinazzi's Formula One career. That's what you were hearing. Oh, sirens of emergency. Um, <laughs> oh, so, yeah, but no, fully agree with everything that you said. I think that is probably going to be the situation with Alfa Romeo. I have to say, though, and I actually, my previous video that I did was on this, but having the Ferrari Drivers Academy at the back of your mind must be like 
a bunch of wasps just flying around your head consistently. Like it must be very hard to ignore the fact that they have this talent pool of drivers that they all want to promote in some way or some form. And having to perform day in, day out is, must be must be quite uh, quite a mentally taxing thing to do. I imagine how caveat feels, you know, for example, yeah. like uh, knowing that Sonoda, Vips, and Lawson are there. They're coming. Yeah, yeah. they're coming. This, this is like the bell tolls with thee. <laughs> <laughs> all righty but cool okay we've i think we've now broadly discussed all of the all of the teams and, and and sort of their performances during during the race today so josh now we move on to what is probably the flagship event of every mm. every podcast or race recap that i do and that is that is the awards the tf1 awards that we hand out at yeah. the end of every race and i you know i repeat this every race but i think it's worth repeating that you know, you get the Autosport Awards, you get the FIA year-end awards, but in terms of status, in terms of, you know, career-defining cap- capability that, that an award can have, I don't think any of those really, really match the, the status of getting one of the TF1 awards, especially now that we have Josh Ravel to, 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 to hand out some of them as well. So let's let's talk about the first the first award, which is uh, the aptly named Pastor Maldonado Award for most dunderheaded deed. So who do you think did something galactically stupid this weekend that deserves that deserves praise? Oh boy, um, trying to think of what was. Uh, I suppose probably that award would go to uh, Kimi for sending uh, George Russell into low Earth orbit. Um, yes. That would probably be more something in line with what uh, Great Lord Pastor Maldonado would do. Yeah, I think that's a that's a, that's a fair award. Maybe somebody that I would have nominated was uh, Alex Albon for his magnificent chop of. Uh, Kvyat's front wings. Yes. That was also a really, really impressive attempt by by Albon to ruin his race. So yeah. I'd I definitely give it to to Kimi and Alex for for their magnificent attempts there. So the next award is the Lewis Hamilton hashtag blessed award for luckiest driver. Which driver had the luck fall on his side over the race weekend? Mm. Luck fall. Um. Chico Perez for Lance getting the runs. Fair. I think Onika Hulkenberg for having another another run in a in a in a, in, a, in an F1 car. Thanks to thanks to Lance Stroll's uh, you know fluid bottom half. And we also have um, I think we can maybe put Dan Ricardo in there as well for a very very timely safety car that potentially saved his bacon against a, a charging Perez. For, for third place, not necessarily. I don't think it's it's a, it's it's a done deal around whether he would have overtaken Daniel, but I think it definitely made Ren- Renault's not- lives a bit easier having the safety con and putting on the new tires. Hmm. Alrighty, then last award is the Nico Hulkenberg Podium Award for for unluckiest for unluckiest driver. Who do you, I mean? There's, I think, an obvious candidate in our in Lord Lancelot and his uh, and his medical medical emergencies. But anyone else that you think could 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 qualify for the award? Hmm. Yeah, I don't really think of anything really at the moment. Ah, uh, uh, Lando Norris for his car burning to the ground because mm-hmm. he wasn't in a good position at that time. The yeah. Nico Hulkenberg uh, podium award. It's the only piece of silverware, only piece of silverware associated with Nico Hulkenberg and podium. Or that's right. so ironically. That's all. I'm all about iron, irony on, on on this podcast. So absolutely, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that that's yeah. brilliant. All right, so that's essentially the end of the podcast. I think Josh, we have. We might say we have single-handedly solved all of the problems in F1, um, and this people will probably look back at this 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 podcast episode and say those two had the wisdom 
and the wherewithal to lead F1 into a new golden era and essentially sort out all of the different problems that the teams are facing at the moment because, I mean, we have solved some big problems today, I think. Oh, there's one more that we have to solve. And that is? I'm speaking to you, Chase Carey. Don't go to Rio. Stick to Interlagos. Yes. Let, like, let, let's talk about that quickly. I mean, we've been talking for so long. Mm. A couple of extra minutes doesn't matter. Why would you not have your Grand Prix at Interlagos? Interlagos has probably been the track over the last 10 years. If I think about how long I've been watching F1 properly, Interlagos has been the track that has given us the most crazy races that I can remember. Like how many amazing races can you recall from Interlagos? And the, yeah, I just don't understand it. I don't understand. Mm. I think it, it's more just about getting it into a sort of central location or something like that. It's just like, look, yeah. guys, don't cut down some rainforest for it. Remember, you know that Olympic village that you guys have, you know, that one that's sort of lying in ruin now that uh, Michael Phelps is not using the Olympic village for a sex dungeon. You know, that is Jacare Pagua, former site of the old Grand Prix circuit. It was flat and boring, but if you want a Rio Grand Prix uh, circuit, put it through there. Uh, go I mean, to Goiana and add a couple of corners. You know, like there's no, no, no one wants it. No, literally, nobody wants this new circuit where you're cutting down some rainforest in between two slots. Nobody wants it. Nobody. I, I've not heard of one person in the have, world that have said, you know what? What we need is another racetrack in brazil that's that's gonna help f1 is if you have another racetrack in brazil over some chopped down trees i heard someone that does this, that does actually support that Joe scary <laughs> yeah. but you know like no uh, fully, fully I, agree. I would rather i would rather he chopped down his mustache before he starts chopping down rainforest and i don't want either of those natural wonders to go to waste it's just hundred <laughs> percent. And also, like, uh, how many other problems, big problems, do we have to solve in Formula One before we get to the Brazilian rainforest being too luscious, too populous? Like, I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, we're beating a dead horse here, I guess. But <laughs> moral of the story, moral of the story is Chase Carey: don't chop down the Brazilian rainforest for a Rio track that's probably going to be rubbish looking at it well now it's sussed it ain't happening now so we can all rest easy we can rest easy we can go on with our day we have solved all of formula one's problems so josh i want to thank you so much for taking the time obviously firstly for getting up in the wee hours of the morning there in new zealand and having a chat with me about everything and anything in f1 it's 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 a big privilege obviously to have you on and i hope you enjoyed it i hope to have you back at some point where we can maybe solve more problems in the world of f1 now obviously if you guys haven't subscribed to josh and there probably aren't many of you given that josh josh recently (laughs) he got he got physical evidence of of how much he is subscribed Uh, what you're gonna do yep but there there, there, there. is yes you can see it there in the background look at that so if you haven't for the adhesive doesn't make it fall down just one day i just hear crash (laughs) That would have been quite a moment. Imagine like when you point to it and then it just falls to the floor. That would have been quite quite a statement. But in any case, if you haven't subscribed, go and subscribe to Josh's channel. He is all about identifying problems in F1 and telling us about it and then um, making us laugh about it as well. So, so yeah, Josh, thank you so much for joining and hopefully I can have you on soon again. Yeah, no worries, man. Thanks very much for having me on. No, it's, it's, it's been great. And now I can maybe just park on some YouTuber admin that we always need to do at the end of the day where I need to ask you to please like, to please comment, and to please hit the subscribe button if you enjoyed this very long uh, episode. But I mean, with the amount of wisdom contained, I'm sure that's a sacrifice you're, you're, you're willing to make. And you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at TF1 show on Twitter if you want to read more of my ramblings and I will be back next week with another episode. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Cheers.